Hello to all those who survived a full day of lectures, beginning yesterday, actually. So I'm sure you are quite exhausted. But perhaps you're still curious about some aspects of the Balfour Declaration that have not been uh, treated. I have had, I was sitting around uh, during this conference and the more one talked, the more I thought about all the aspects of uh, the history of the Balfour Declaration that have not been treated, that have not been even mentioned uh, in this conference. So one day is perhaps not enough, but the one day is what we have, and this will be our last uh, session. Um, we have, perhaps like me, you may have noticed that there are two lines of thought about the history of the uh, Balfour Declaration. One has to do with the origins and the sources and the people involved and the way uh, the uh, declaration was interpreted uh, in its initial stages and so on. And one has to do with its further implications, with the fact that 100 years after the, this letter that at the beginning may not have seemed very important, that 100 years afterwards we are still uh, interested and involved in interpreting it and uh, experiences, experiencing such uh, conflicting interpretations of the same piece of paper, one may say, not even a document. And, and uh, this, this sort of long-term uh, development is the second line, I think, of what interests us here. And so since the lectures in this conference are mixed with one another in a in a postmodern way, uh, we have a, um, a, a session this afternoon which deals first with the long-term commemoration of uh, the event of the writing of the, or the publication of the Balfour Declaration, and a very short-term, uh, lecture about the origins and the way leading to the Balfour de Declaration. Why is it in the same uh, session? Perhaps in order to play with these two perspectives, the long term, the development, the 100 years perspective, and the short term historical question, what was how did it happen? Why did it happen? Who were the people involved? What did they think? And so on. So this is what we are going to have today. And the first lecture will be not about the sources, but about the long-term commemoration. It will be given by Professor Eli Poder, who is a professor has a chair in the history of the Muslim peoples at the Department of Islamic and Middle Eastern Studies at the Hebrew University. Uh, he's uh, also a senior research fellow at the Truman Institute for uh, the advancement of peace. And at the present, he serves as the president of the Middle East and Islamic Association of Israel. So he has all the tools to talk about the Islamic way of looking at, at the Balfour Declaration, but he will talk about Israel and the commemoration in Israel. So this is here yet another paradox of this conference. He has published and edited 12 books and many, many essays and articles, and perhaps the publication that is perhaps is more relevant, I don't know, but I think perhaps it is the most relevant, is his book, The Politics of National Celebrations in the Arab World. And so today, he will talk to us about the diversity within a show of unity commemorating the Balfour Declaration in Israel, 1917 to 
2017. Ellie, it's your floor. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for inviting me here to give uh, the lecture. Well, um, uh, I first want to address uh, two points that you raised, uh, because uh, I think uh, they uh, were uh, very relevant. The first one, you mentioned uh, publications on the Islamic and the Arab world, and the fact that I belong to the Department of Islamic Studies and so on, how come Israel and so on. That's definitely the point that I'm trying to make. Israel is in the Middle East, and we, uh, the Orientalists, or those who engage in Middle Eastern studies, we should also learn and study Israel, because I, at least, believe that Israel should be considered as part of the Middle East. And yes, it is connected to um, the research on the celebrations in the Arab world, because at that time, while conducting that research, uh, I'm, I think quite incidentally, I came uh, and checked uh, something that was connected with the Balfour Declaration, and then I saw something very interesting that happened on the 15th, uh, 50th anniversary, on the Jubilee in 1967. I'll talk about it in a minute. And that's how I uh, came into the subject, which eventually ended up in an article that was uh, published in Hebrew a few years ago. And when I finished it, it was something like seven years ago. The end, I mean, the last sentence was, it would be interesting to follow what will happen on the centennial. And we are now in the middle of it, and obviously quite a lot is happening. So that by itself is interesting, because as you'll see, during the years, many years, we haven't celebrated it, and it wasn't very significant, and that the Palestinians, they remember it uh, much more than uh, we did. So therefore, uh, I think uh, this is interesting by itself. And now, let me move to what I'm going to talk about. The major question of this lecture is uh, how the Balfour Declaration is reflected in the Israeli collective uh, memory. My, uh, search, my uh, research dealt with the state celebrations, but I will elaborate here on other socializations instrument as well. The Balfour Declaration was commemorated annually by the Jewish issue in mandatory Palestine. Although this custom was discontinued after 48, the idea of holding state festivities on the occasions of the 50th anniversary was proposed in early 1967, but the tension along the Egyptian and Syrian borders put the tentative plans on hold. Following the war, the government decided to revive the tentative uh, plans and on the basis of the early plans, November was proclaimed as the Balfour Weizmann Month, and various events were held. In the post-67 period, the day had once more vanished from the national calendar. And now we are facing the centennial, and obviously, as I said, it will be interesting to see what happened on that day. Now, let me say something uh, in general about state holidays and their function. State holidays function as important agents of commemoration and socialization instrument used by the state to establish the nation's collective memory. The national calendar aims at achieving two goals. One, to establish and reinforce the legitimacy of the existing political and social order. The second, to reinforce a sense of solidarity among the members of a political community. State rituals are also used as institutionalized and orderly means of emphasizing a nation myth of origin. So therefore, the Balfour Declaration is a kind of myth of origin, although it's not the only one. Um, <clears throat> the Balfour Declaration Day can be viewed as an attempt to celebrate the birth of the state in the modern era, and at the same time to underscore the legitimacy 
of the Zionist and later Israeli state and solidarity among its uh, citizens. But in spite of the recognized importance of the Balfour Declaration in Jewish history, the Balfour Declaration Day has never reached a consensual form. It was open to different narratives and interpretations. And this is the major argument of my article and what I'm going to present uh, here. Uh, most of the holidays celebrated by the Yishuv, now I'm going to say a few words about the period between 48 and 67. Most of the holidays during that period were related to Jewish religious uh, traditions, uh, such as uh, Rosh Hashanah, Sukkot, Hanukkah, Purim, Shavuot, and Tisha B'Av. Situated in the geographic context of the land of Israel, these holidays attained national secular significance. In addition, a small number of commemoration days were observed. The most important of these was the Tel Chai Day, Yom Tel Chai on 11 Adar. Other events attained semi-holiday status and were typically observed in ceremonies and assemblies in schools and government institutions, but did not become national holidays. One of them is the Balfour Day, celebrated on 17th Cheshvan, Yudzain Becheshvan, or November 2, or Bet Be November. On its first anniversary, the Zionist Commission for Palestine organized festivities and parades in Jerusalem. Yet during the British mandate, the Balfour Declaration Day never attained the status of a formal holiday for several reasons. First, the Yishuv did not enjoy sovereignty and therefore could not conduct official national ceremonies. Second, since the Yishuv viewed British policy as a gradual retreat from the Balfour Declaration, the day was never celebrated wholeheartedly. Third, leading Zionists had reservations regarding the declaration. The right-wing revisionists considered Britain as imperialist power, while the religious parties considered the Jews' right to the land of Israel in terms of the divine promise. So it was mainly the labor movement that took step to preserve the Balfour Declaration memory. A certain ambivalence characterized the event. The discourse in the press shows that the Balfour Declaration Day evoked contrasting feelings, sorrow alongside joy, anxiety alongside hope. On the 10th anniversary, uh, the Zionist and British flags were flown over the buildings housing, the national institution, and other buildings, some private homes. On that occasion, assemblies, conventions, parades, balls, concerts took place in Tel Aviv. Youth movement celebrated the day, but in different ways. There were differences between the youth movements of Herut and labor, and that is important. You see later why. And also it was celebrated abroad, in Vienna, in Warsaw, in London, where there were major concentration of uh, Jews. In contrast, the Arabs in Palestine turned the day into a mourning day. The common rituals were strikes, demonstrations, rallies, occasional outbursts of violence, submission of petitions calling for the abolition of the declaration. The core of the Arab narrative in the press was that and I quote, the promise was given by those who do not own the land to those who don't deserve it. And by the way, this is still part of the Palestinian narrative. At the end of my lecture, I will say something about the Palestinian narrative because as I understand, I mean, I'm the one here responsible for the commemoration, particularly on the Israeli Jewish side. So I said, well, I say something also maybe on the Palestinian side for um, to give some balance. Impressive ceremonies were conducted in the Hebrew school system in mandatory Palestine. School festivities were very organized. So in contrast to the public, where the event was half-heartedly commemorated, in schools there was a very organized um, a schedule with certain rituals that repeated themselves and uh, the councils of teachers who supervised the whole event in the three streams of education, at that time, it uh, organized the, the event. So there was a big difference because between what happened in the public sphere and also in the education system. Now, 
Let's uh, talk a little bit about other socialization or commemoration instrument. On the year 1922, a moshav called Balfouria was established in Emek Israel near Afula. Many streets in Israel carry the name of Balfour. The one in Tel Aviv was inaugurated when Balfour visited Palestine in 1925 on the occasion of the establishment of the cornerstone for the Hebrew University on Mount Scopus. It was the second city, as uh, Rishon Lezion was the first. 21 cities have a Balfour Street, including Jerusalem, not far from here, where the home of the Prime Minister is located, and according to uh, Bargal from Haifa University, uh, it's not a very common name. Balfour is not a very common name for a street in Israel. As I said, 21. You can guess, uh, I guess you can guess, uh, who is the major hero? Herzl, of course. Herzl in 58 streets. Uh, the second is, can anyone guess who is the second? Jabotinsky. Jabotinsky. Jabotinsky is the second, yes. 53, Weizmann, the hero of the Balfour Declaration, 52. Ben Gurion only in 41, by the way. Okay, very interesting. All right, that about the period uh, until 48. 48, 67. In those years, the Balfour Declaration largely disappeared from public limelight. I mean, this is interesting. Completely disappeared. The date was not celebrated or observed and was even absent from the school system calendar. We may call this collective amnesia. Ironically, it was the Herut Party newspaper editorial, the Herut Party editorial, that expressed surprise on the occasion of the 40th anniversary at the lack of attention to the Balfour Declaration. And I quote, the 2nd of November, Balfour Declaration Day. Does anyone remember this date? Does anyone celebrate it? The date means nothing, not only to the younger generation who were born after World War I, it also means nothing to that earlier generation, the, the, the generation from the time uh, the declaration was made. The newspaper explained that forgetting was not accidental. It was closely tied to Britain's broken promises. Four reasons in my mind explain the disappearance of Balfour Day commemorations from this national calendar. First, the establishment of Israel in 48 and the institutionalization of Independence Day largely removed the need to celebrate the Balfour Declaration Day. The recognition of the Jewish state by the United Nations in the 47 made the Balfour Declaration superfluous. Second, every national movement prefers to base its origin on heroic deeds and achievements, like the 48 war, and not on diplomatic lobbying. In some ways, the Balfour Declaration underwent a similar process to that of the Cyrus Edict, Atzarat Koresh, which had disappeared from collective Israeli memory as well. Third, the positive aspects of the Balfour Declaration were overshadowed by the deterioration in British Zionist relations since the 1939 White Paper. And finally, even if the declaration had historical significance, and it did, it was politically controversial, particularly for religious and right-wing elements. Nevertheless, it remained an important component in the historical narrative taught in school books because it was part of the argument that legitimized the Jewish state. And now we come to 67. In late 1966, the Israel and British Commonwealth Association suggested the idea of celebrating the Balfour year. Now, in the past, this association organized the annual Balfour dinner in Israel, typically attended by a low-key British official, reflecting a policy designed to honor the occasion without antagonizing Arab states. Initially, the aim of the planned celebrations in Israel and London was modest, primarily designed to demonstrate the strong, solid relations existing between Britain and Israel. In Israel, it was decided that November would be declared the Balfour Weizmann month, and that the Jubilee 
would be linked to other symbolic dates that incidentally coincided the 20th anniversary of the UN partition plan, Tochnit HaChaluka, November 47, uh, the anniversary of the immigration of the Ramban. Okay? The, it was uh, the 1200th celebration, Shnata Elif Matayim, Laaliyato Shel HaRamban, the great Jewish medieval scholar. Later, it was decided to add the 15th, not the 50th, the 15th anniversary of the death of Chaim Weizmann. He died in 1952. And uh, he was, of course, the major architect of the declaration. And I didn't finish the 17th anniversary of the first Zionist Congress in Basel, uh, 1897. So a full program was devised, and I'm not going to describe it. I, anyone who is interested can see it uh, in my article. And, but in addition, uh, medals and stamps bearing the pictures of both Balfour and Weizmann were issued, carrying a quotation from the book of Jeremiah, your children shall come back to their own country. Vishavu banim legvulam. Okay, so that's it. Now, the motivation to revive the memory of the declaration stemmed from a desire to reaffirm the legitimacy of the existing political order and boost national morale at the time of economic and security uncertainty. I'm quoting Tom Segev, and he said, beginning in 1966, more and more Israelis had started to lose faith in themselves and sink into depression. The doubt was anywhere, and it led to despair. Due to the tension along the borders in summer 67, it was not clear if the festivities will take part at all. And then came the war with the unexpected result. Paradoxically, the results of the war emphasized the legitimacy crisis. As a result of Israel's victory, it now included a large Arab population that challenged the state's very right of existence, rejecting Israel's claim to the conquered lands and even to its right of existence. The religious camp remained firm in their belief that the claim to the land was grounded in God's promise to the Jewish people in the Bible. The legitimacy crisis mainly pervaded the secular camp, which was forced to answer the question, why here of all places? The acquisition of new territories rekindled the need among secular Zionists to revalidate the Jewish claim now with reference to the entire area of the homeland. Thus, the government exploited the opportunity to celebrate a confluence of no less than five milestone commemoration days, which incidentally occurred almost immediately after the war and its great result. The main event of the Jubilee celebration was a special Knesset session on the 1st of November, attended by many, the president, many leaders, and so on. And you'll be surprised to hear, one of the participants was one called Yichia Dahabani, who had served as Herzl coachman. Okay? Yichia Dahabani was still alive. I mean, the one, Ha'eglon Shelo. Ha'eglon, Beivri, Shel Herzl. Azu, Nachach Bachagigot Gamken. Uh, in an unusual gesture, the, leader, the leaders of all 10 parliamentary parties were invited to speak at a special session. Um, you know, this is a very unusual step because usually you give uh, the opportunity to, obviously, to the prime minister and then to the leader of the opposition. But here you had 10 people from different parties who gave uh, their version. And eventually, the, the whole session took three hours and according to the papers, was very, very boring. And very few left at the end of the discussion. As we can see now in many Knesset debate, this is usually the situation, right? So that was the situation as well at the end of that um, a very important uh, celebration. Now, the Knesset event revealed the existence of no less than seven narratives of the Balfour Declaration. The Labour, the right wing, the centrist, Rafi, the National Religious, Mizrahi, Orthodox Haredi, Knaanite, and Communist. The differences were not related to facts, but to their interpretations. Now, I don't have too much time, you know, in order 
to describe them, but in a nutshell, I would say a sentence or two about every one of them. The labor. Obviously, it emphasized the role of labor in attaining the Balfour Declaration. Its heroes, everyone had its heroes. Its heroes were, typically, Herzl and Weizmann. And that's by itself interesting because Weizmann had its quarrels with the labor, but by that time, they had already settled all their disputes and uh, they were in a position to honor Weizmann uh, as well. Um, the enemies. The enemies were the supporters of assimilation, like the Bund in Russia, and religious people who opposed Zionism. Couch in secular terms, it was not devoid of religious or even messianic elements. This is the labor. The right-wing narrative acknowledged its importance of the Balfour Declaration as a historical document that contains recognition of the Jewish state in Eretz Israel, but it played down its significance. Its negative elements were emphasized, its vague formulation, the severing of one half of the homeland and granting it to one of the desert princes. They referred obviously to King Abdallah of Jordan. He was one of the desert princes. Its heroes, Herzl, okay, was one of its heroes, but you can imagine who was the second one, Jabotinsky. Uh, the father of the rebellion against foreign rule. It emphasized the importance of the military battle, and hence Etzel and Lehi are mentioned along Nili. Weizmann was attributed a marginal role. Enemies, the Great Mountain. What is the Great Mountain? The problem of the Arabs in Eretz Israel. They called it the Great Mountain. The center, the center was quite similar, in fact, to the labor, but with one minor, which is major, difference. Uh, and the second hero after Herzl is, of course, Ben-Gurion. Ben-Gurion is the second hero and uh, not uh, Weizmann. The national religious narrative, the Balfour Declaration was only a stage in the long process of redemption, which include also the Six Day War. The narrative was grounded in two texts, the Bible, and the writings of Rabbi Abraham Yitzchak Cohen Cook, the spiritual founder of Mizrahi movement. This narrative had no, use, had no use for the Balfour Declaration as a title or deed to Eretz Israel because the religious Jewish justification of ownership rested on the Bible. This narrative emphasized the role of Zionist religious leaders preceding Chovevei Zion, such as Kalisher, Moliver, Reines, members, of course, of Mizrahi. This narrative had no secular heroes, including Herzl. Haredi narrative. The right on Eretz Israel is based on the Bible, period. The Jewish connection is also based on the continued presence of Jews in their homeland. The Haredi narrative emphasized the role of Orthodox Jewish leaders that preceded Chovevei Zion, like Hildesheimer. The importance of the Balfour Declaration was the re-establishing the link of the Jews to the land based on the Bible. The role of the secular Zionist leader Herzl was particularly criticized, and I quote, forgive me for saying that such an idea to replace Zion and Jerusalem with Uganda or any other country could not have been made by the mind of a Jew who recites, and our eyes will witness your return to Zion three times a day. So, you don't even mention uh, Herzl. The Canaanite narrative, Uri Avneri, Aulam Azeh, the party called to establish a Hebrew nation that should become integral part of the Semitic region. The Balfour Declaration was seen as a grave error on part of Zionism because it symbolized the alliance between Zionism and foreign empire instead of taking path that was eluded in the faisal weizmann Agreement in 1919. Yes, okay, scam faisal weizmann they talk about the relation between Jews and Arabs. And finally, the, Knan, the communist narrative. The two communist parties, Maki and Rakach, expressed their protest by silence. Rakach decided to boycott the session, while Maki leader, Mikunis, attended the session but did not address the audience. To be silent is still to speak, 
said French sociologist Maurice Blanchon. So the fact that they were silent doesn't mean that they didn't speak, obviously. The main event commemorating the 50th anniversary, the Knesset session, turned into a demonstration of disunity and disorder. In historical perspective, the event's significance lies in the exposure of the multiple voices existing in society with regard to the Balfour Declaration. Most speakers concurred that the event was a major episode in the history of the Zionist movement on its path toward statehood, yet each offered an interpretation that was largely dictated by ideology and political affiliation. And each narrative uh, identified its heroes and all the details that I mentioned before, so I'm not going to repeat. I do want to make a generalization. Sociological theories, they suggest four types of national commemorations. One is consensual. The second is fragmented. The third is imposed or controlled. And the fourth one is multivocal. The 50th anniversary of the Balfour Declaration seems as a multivocal commemoration. Yet since the various narrative voices in the Knesset session were also expressed in the media and at other public events, it would seem that the event represented also a kind of fragmented commemoration. Baruch Kimberling argued that a status secular Zionist hegemony in the Gramscian sense evolved in the post-48 period, enforcing its position by controlling critical social agents such as education and media. The commemoration of the Balfour Declaration Jubilee indicates, however, that effort to establish such hegemony through state rituals and control of the national calendar had limited success. Although the group that comprised the Jewish collective agreed on the significance of key events in the history of the Zionist movement, this group interpreted them, interpret them in line with their respective ideological position. And by the way, it's not very different from what happened to the Masada myth, to the Bar Kokhva story. And so the Balfour Declaration may be entering the same pantheon. The, review, the renewed Balfour Declaration festivities were a single short-lived episode. The event disappeared again from the national calendar for the same reasons it had disappeared after 48, although it was occasionally marked by Arabs and Palestinians on the annual day. By the way, interestingly, on the 17th, the 70th anniversary in um, 1987, Hillel, uh, Shlomo Hillel, the speaker of the Knesset, there was no event. Uh, but as a speaker of uh, parliament, he said for the record, for the protocol, he said, I want to say something about the Balfour Declaration that nobody will say that only the Arabs and Palestinians commemorate it. That's ironic and funny, maybe, in a way, because he was very much aware that the Arabs and the Palestinians, they remember it much more than just Jews. By the way, at that year, uh, the copy, the, the, the original of the Balfour Declaration, for the first and only time, came here and was uh, presented at the Knesset. And um, uh, I want to thank the information that I received only yesterday, that information for the one who was responsible at the Knesset, or is today responsible for the exhibition today, but was familiar to these details of what happened in 1987. Anyway, so going back to the renewed uh, festivities or what was not a renewal, I found only one expression by Olmert on the 19th, uh, 90th anniversary and some statement that he made, but there was no celebration. And at the, sa at the same time, on the 2007 year, a poll revealed that 34% of the respondents and 50%, half of the youngsters, did not know who Balfour was or what the declaration was about. Okay? Two, 10 years ago. I'm about to finish. Three paragraphs. The revival of the Balfour Declaration memory on the occasion of the 100th year 
is related to the fact that it incidentally coincides with three other landmarks in Jewish and Israeli history. The 120th anniversary of the first Zionist Congress, the first 70th anniversary of the UN partition plan, and the 50th anniversary of the 1967 war. All these anniversaries serve as an opportunity for Israel and various Jewish Zionist organizations to emphasize the Jewish people leg legitimate claim to the country. In effect, the unresolved conflict with the Palestinians, which also divides Israeli society, necessitates continued reaffirmation of Israel's rights to the land, particularly targeting the country's secular Jewish elements who are less inclined to accept the biblical justification without reservation. At present, clearly we are witnessing another battleground between Israel and the Palestinians. This time, uh, between two antagonistic collective memories, each claiming to present his historical truth. But the correct conflict is not over the whole land, but with regard to the boundaries of the 1967 war. The PA have this decided that this year will commemorate the centennial of the Balfour Declaration, the, 50, the 70th anniversary of the Nakba, the 1948 Nakba, and the 50th anniversary of the 1967 occupation. The Balfour Declaration, therefore, is the source of all trouble and evil. According to the, Balf to the Palestinian narrative, the Balfour Declaration is the beginning of the Nakba. They are demanding from Britain to apologize for the declaration and compensate them by recognizing a Palestinian state along the 67 boundaries and solution of the refugee problem. If not, they are going to sue the British government for all the damage caused by the aim of uh, Britain, uh, uh, sorry, uh, <laughs> for the damage to sue the British government for all the damages caused by the British declaration. Britain is not, Britain is not going to apologize. As Prime Minister May recently declared, but the aim of the Palestinian public campaign is to use the centenary in order to awaken the public awareness and consciousness to the injustice in their eyes, which inflicted on them by issuing the Balfour Declaration, which is the real source of trouble in their point of view. Interestingly, the fact that the Palestinians demand an apology and not abolishing the Balfour Declaration means, in my mind, recognition of it as a fact of life. Finally, another interesting remark. As we saw, the right, the right wing in, the, in Israel appreciate, appreciated the Balfour Declaration but was critical of it. It was the labor which promoted the Balfour Declaration as its achievement. Even in 1967, the right was still critical of it. 50 years later, it is the right under Netanyahu who leads the centennial, the 100th celebration, with various festivities organized. Still, it will be interesting to read the protocols at the Knesset event and to learn whether the Balfour Declaration became more consensual than before. Thank you very much. <laughs>